this afternoon to you, 4 o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Uh, NFL owners meetings concluded out uh, in Orlando. Um, some news that the Browns are really interested in um, extending Amari Cooper. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Take a look at, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Jerry Judy extension to begin with. So 2025 free agents. These are receivers that will be free agents uh, coming up um, at the end of the season. That's when Judy's contract was due to expire. Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, T. Higgins, those guys are going to reset the, the wide receiver market. You've also got Keenan Allen, Chris Godwin, Amari Cooper, who um, we know his contract will be up in, in Waddle and Devontae Smith. So a, a huge group of uh, wide receivers who will be free agents 2025. This is what uh, Jerry Judy's extension looks like. This from over the cap. So you see the, the cap number and the guaranteed money. Cap number for next year is 4.7. That was there already. 7, 9, 7, 10, 13. That 28, 9 is voided. That's the final year, 2028. 20, you see the guaranteed salary numbers. It's, you know, 21 guaranteed. Um, that on top of the 13 million that they converted to uh, be guaranteed from his. Uh, Fifth year deal, so the, the first year. So it wasn't the extension, but that's the uh, amount of guaranteed is uh, a little over 20, 21 million. Let's welcome in Sam Monson, Pro Football Focus. Sam, I, we had talked a little bit leading up to the show. I told you that the extension, some Browns fans didn't like it. Um, when you look at it relative to what the wide receiver market is going to be, just your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair deal. Jerry Judy is seen as one of these guys that's viewed in the through the lens of disappointing first round draft pick. You know, the, the Broncos were already moving on from him. They've effectively determined that he wasn't the guy they, they thought they were drafting. Um, and so any team that brings that on board, that's how he's being viewed. But if you view it through the lens of simply they've traded for a guy and have paid him, commensurate with being a solid number two option, you know, opposite a guy like Amari Cooper, then it is fair market value. And some of the numbers are a little bit inflated because they're kicking the money down the line. And they're sort of, that, that's the way the Cleveland Browns have approached their salary cap situation uh, recently. Um, under those circumstances or through that lens, it's a perfectly reasonable deal for a guy that does have an awful lot of skills you know whether or not he's been a disappointment relative to his draft spot he can separate at a very high level he's a great route runner he's got uh, elite physical tools and maybe can be a better player in cleveland you know now that he can be the true number two uh, if they can get their quarterback situation firing theoretically it's a better environment for him to showcase what he can actually do and therefore get the best years out of it yeah when you look at him 24 years old um is it out of the realm of possibility to expect him to kind of take a step forward? I, I mean, there's certainly, if you look at what he did in Alabama, there was a lot there. Um, he's young still, I guess. I'm looking for reasons for optimism if you are a Browns fan, I guess. No, I think there should be some. Look, I, I really like Jerry Judy coming out because he was one of the best separators and route runners to come into the league for a long period of time. In fact, maybe the guy that was best at that before he uh, came in was Amari Cooper, actually. Amari Cooper was a phenomenal route runner as a prospect as well. So I, I think we've seen in Denver, Jerry Judy's route running and his ability to separate, particularly against man coverage, still absolutely plays at this level. He's been um, unable to kind of develop the other areas of his game. He hasn't been great at the catch point. He hasn't been great physically when dealing with press coverage or with just aggressive coverage, particularly deep down the field. He's got a couple of highlight plays here or there, but generally speaking, it's been a weakness. But I do think that there are reasons to think that, number one, the, the stuff that he's good at puts a very high floor on what he's able to do. Like he will get, he will be open, he will get targets, he will make some plays because that separation plays. Um, and then you're going to get to see if he can be more than he's been so far in his time in Denver. And I, I, there's no reason he can't be. I mean, he's got the physical skill set to do that. Maybe he'll never be a great catch point receiver, but they don't necessarily need him to be with the other players they have um, already on the depth chart. So, yeah, look, I, I think there's absolutely reason to think that his best football is still ahead of it. So um, let's take a look at updated 
team needs after free agency. This is from PFF, Pro Football Focus. Uh, Browns linebacker, offensive tackle, wide receiver. They could use a run-stopping linebacker to complement a defense that uh, heavily leans on pass rush coverage prowess. Both of the teams starting offensive tackles suffered season-ending injuries. Jedrick Will's contract expires at the end of 2024. Browns could search for a left tackle um, in case of that eventual departure. Uh, Judy's arrival welcomed, uh, but the team could use a another weapon. All fair, when, when you look at this roster, um, what do you see and, and what do you think of the roster? I think it's a very good roster and you know you look at those team needs and they sort of come across as a little bit nitpicky you know you're saying well that's not really a need we've got Jordan Hicks brought in at linebacker you look at the offensive tackles and it's the, the same group effectively as it was from a year ago when they were fine even though they have to go they've even got depth you know the guy like Dewan Jones showing last season that he could be a starter and probably should be a starter right away um, but it is a long-term uh, type of thing because the roster is so good right now. You're looking at top to bottom and you say, there really aren't that many holes in this on this group. So we're looking for where could they upgrade or where do they need to plan for next year when in terms of needs or that kind of thing. I think they've done a really good job of putting the roster back together again because it was a brief period of time when it kind of it started to erode and it looked like maybe they weren't going to be able to keep a a legitimately high-end roster together, particularly once they um, made the trade for Deshaun Watson and given him the huge contract. But they've done a fantastic job, I think, of putting it back together and really um, attacking what is a championship-caliber roster if they can just get high-end quarterback play again. Yeah, and, and again, um, this from the Bleach Report, and it kind of feeds into what you're saying there. One sentence, uh, post-free agency advice for each team ahead of 2024 draft. Browns, keep making it all about support for Deshaun Watson because all of your eggs are already stuck in that basket. Um, I get that. I mean, it's true, but I, I think the Browns still believe in him. And everything they've done, the, the offensive coaches they've brought in, um, Jerry Judy, all of the moves have been to try to maximize the skill sets of Deshaun Watson. When you saw him last year, as, as a guy that just watched him, what did, what did you see? And I know you didn't see enough of him because he was injured, but what did you see with Deshaun Watson? Yeah, I mean, I think that has to be the approach, right? They, they don't have an alternative. They're, the, the way that contract is structured, the fully guaranteed deal, they can't even do what the Broncos did with Russell Wilson. Even if they determine he, he's not going to be the guy, they don't have an out. You know, they're tied to him for the duration of that contract effectively. So they have to give him every chance possible to succeed. And we've seen he's capable of doing it. You know, we, the, the last full season he had in Houston, he was playing as well as any quarterback in the league. He was playing at that all pro level. There's no reason he can't get back to that level. So we need to keep finding reasons that he hasn't hit that so far in Cleveland and change those things and try and get him to that level again, because he's clearly still got the physical ability. Um, I think we saw that last season. He he's got all the tools you want, the arm, the athleticism, um, maybe we just haven't found the right kind of scheme in terms of playing to what he wants to do. You know, we need to, I think, find a better combination of what are the concepts Deshaun Watson likes running? Uh, how do we maximize his comfort level within the system? And then, as you say, adding the weaponry, you know, bringing in a Jerry Judy, maybe drafting somebody, keeping around guys like David Njoku and Amari Cooper and making just the, the totality of the system and the support system around him as good as it can be because he has to be the guy. All right, before we uh, take a quick break, um, curious to what you think the other teams in the AFC North have done. You know, the, the division was really good, and I think the only team that didn't get – in the Ravens might have gotten significantly better. You look at the, the Bengals, they had the, the left tackle they need. I would liked what the Steelers did. I, I think they solved – I think they have the pieces to solve their quarterback issue. What are your thoughts of, of them getting Wilson and Justin Fields? Yeah, I, I think given where they were in terms of options, in terms of where they could go and get a, a clear upgrade at quarterback versus Kenny Pickett, I think they've done as well as they could have. You know, Russell Wilson is an interesting reclamation project and an interesting fit within that Arthur Smith offense in Pittsburgh. Um, I, you, can, you can see the arguments both for and against that working out very well 
Um, and then Justin Fields for the, the cost, I think, is a fantastic gamble. Like, we are not convinced that Justin Fields can't be a very high-level quarterback right now. We're just running out of time to find that out before it gets very expensive. And that's why a team like Chicago, it makes perfect sense for them to press the reset button, grab Caleb Williams at the top of this draft, and just restart that rookie contract clock. But for a team like Pittsburgh, it's a perfect gamble to take. It's not costing them much. And there's still every chance that Justin Fields can become that guy. He's gotten better every single year of his career. So I think the Steelers did a great job given where they were at the quarterback spot. And I think they're the team that's kind of taken the most obvious step forward within that division. Um, Cincinnati, I think, kind of they have almost tread water. You know, they lost some players. They brought in some players. I think it probably ends up being about a wash. Baltimore is interesting because obviously Derrick Henry has the, the capacity to be a flashy signing and a, a really obvious upgrade next season, but they also lost a lot of players as well. So I, I don't know that Baltimore have had a fantastic offseason so far. Sam Monson, Pro Football Focus, and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, uh, Sam has done a lot of writing and work on the draft. We'll talk NFL draft and uh, a lot slanted towards the Browns. Sports for CLE with Sam Monson from Pro Football Focus. We'll be right back. Stay with us. All right, everybody. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. Like the $5.25X, it's a nice way to nab up to 150 grand. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever. With five price points from $1 to 20, they're an easy way to uh, break into some fun. We continue talking Browns with Sam Monson from Pro Football Focus. Sam, I know you've written a lot about the upcoming draft. What positions are the strongest? And also, Browns will be taking second and third round picks, likely, unless they trade. Um, what positions do you think they can find value where they might be drafting? Yeah, we're, we hear this almost year on year, but the wide receiver group this season, I think, is genuinely special. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze from Washington, Malik Neighbors from LSU, whose pro day was today. Those three guys, I think, in any normal year would each be the top receiver in the entire draft, and all three of them are coming out at the same time, kind of going head to head. I think they're probably all going to go in the top ten. But then I think the depth in this receiver group is also absolutely ridiculous, and the second and the third round of this year are going to be full of legitimate high-end receiver talents that can come in and make an immediate impact um, in the NFL. I think it's a great year to be both needing a wide receiver and having second and third round draft picks for one. Are, are there guys that you think, um, you know, the Browns, that would fit what the Browns are looking for um, relative to another? They're looking for another weapon for Deshaun Watson. We already we said that last segment. Are there guys that you think – that could be in that second, third round range who would fit what what would uh, be value for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the Browns are in an interesting situation because they don't necessarily have an obvious stylistic uh, type of receiver that they need. You know, there are some uh, teams that go into the draft and they've got a big body possession guy, they've got a, a good route runner, but they really need that speedster. I think the Browns with the receivers that they have kind of have everything covered already. Um, maybe they would like a, a true vertical receiving threat. Um, and there's absolutely those guys in this draft. Uh, but I think that they could go in a number di of different directions in the second or third round in terms of receivers. It's really about just which guy they like the best. Um, but somebody like Lad McConkey from Georgia, who might even sneak his way into the first round, given the way that he's been going. Um, Troy Franklin from Oregon is a big, long, uh, speedy wide receiver. And then Xavier Worthy from Texas, who broke the combine record with his 4 2 uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I think those are guys that any one of those guys could absolutely be available in the second round um, when Cleveland picks. They could also, any one of the three, could end up forcing their way into the first round conversation. The other sort of dynamic with this receiving group is it's incredibly kind of chaotic and tight and close together between wide receivers sort of four and 15. You know, you're going to see a, a radically different group of uh, rankings across the, the draftscape. 
but it means that any one of these guys could sort of be gone in the first round, but they could also slip to the, the top of the third round as well without an awful lot changing. You know, a guy that um, some of the mock drafts have recently started tying to the Browns is Malachi Corley from uh, Western Kentucky. Um, he, he's, he's a run uh, yard after the catch guy, and, and you hear him compared to Debo Samuel. Is, is, is that legit? I feel like it's a stretch. I've seen him compare to Debo Samuel. I've seen him compare to Anquan Bolden as well. I think, honestly, a lot of that comp is because of body type. If you kind of watch him on tape, he's got a very unusual body type where he's big and stocky and, you know, has this kind of huge torso. And it sort of feels like he's this massive, strong bulldozer with the ball in his hands. And he's good after the catch. You know, they get a, they gave him a ton of screens in that offense. But I don't see this Debo Samuel sort of versatile running back slash wide receiver hybrid that can just bust NFL tackles all day um, the way the Debo can. I think he's a little bit more of a conventional wide receiver than that. I'm a little bit lower on him than a lot of people because of that. But he's absolutely like an intriguing option in this draft because he's such an unusual type of receiver. Um, let's turn our attention to running backs. Not as high end as um... – and not as much value placed on them either, but not as high end as wide receivers. Who are some guys in that, you know, second, third, fourth round that you think might be there that might intrigue the Browns? Yeah, it's interesting. This is seen as a bad running back class. Um, and I think the NFL definitely believes that. When you look at free agency, one of the ways of looking at free agency is uh, – sort of viewing it through the lens of the upcoming draft. And if there's a ton of money being spent on certain positions in free agency, it means the NFL probably doesn't think that that group is strong in the draft and, and vice versa. And the way you saw wide receiver approach, the NFL was not necessarily throwing money around at wide receivers in free agency, but they were throwing money at running backs at a position that typically doesn't get those kinds of deals. So the league definitely does not like this running back class, but I actually think it's a lot stronger than, um, than a lot of other people do. And maybe you're not going to get guys in the first round or even the second round, but those rounds you talked about, three, four, five, that's when all the data says you should be drafting running backs anyway, and it's where I think all these guys are going to start going. So Audric Estime, the, the Notre Dame running back, I think has a, a phenomenal NFL skill set. He's big, he's powerful, um, he's got a good burst. He improved his 40 time in his pro day which was a little bit concerning at the combine but he's i think he's explosive and actually can take has big playability can um, take the the ball to the house when he touches it so i think audrey guesme is a really interesting guy um tyrone tracy jr from purdue has a lot of wiggle to his game a bit sort of bigger and stronger than i think he um maybe he came across as but you watch his tape incredible contact balance very difficult to get to the ground very good sort of weaving his way through defenders, he'd be a really intriguing option as well. So I know you do a lot of work on the draft. Who's a guy that you really like in this draft? Doesn't have to be a high draft pick, but I know you guys, when you guys study these, you watch tons and tons and hours of tape. Who's a guy that you watched and you just said, man, I, I think this guy can play. I really like Will Shipley from Clemson, the running back. Um, he, I don't think is particularly high on a lot of people's rankings, but he just has this incredible ability to avoid the hit. You know, people get him lined up and they don't get full contact on him. He's able to weave his way out of it, able to sort of shrug, shrug off the hit and keep on trucking and just finds his way into the gap and into a little bit more space. I, I think he's got the kind of natural instincts and vision and just understanding to play running back at the next level. He seems like a player that would be a better NFL player than he was a college player. All right, before I let you go, um, with the Browns drafting where they are, um, who's a guy that you think if, if, they, if they slid a little, they went up and got him, it'd be a steal, kind of a home run? And I'm thinking in the mold of Jeremiah Wusu koromoa a couple years ago. When he slid down and the Browns went up and got him, everybody was like, ah. Is there a guy that you think that could happen to this year? I honestly think one of those wide receivers, it's that kind of draft where there are going to be guys that are being talked about as first round players um, that end up sliding, not necessarily because of, of something specific like, you know, Dewan Jones, where the league is just sort of against them and they're, they're sliding down, but simply because the rankings are all over the place. And, and there are going to be people that 
everyone thought was going to go in the first round, and they're actually not. They're, instead of being ranked wide receiver four or five, they're going to end up being ranked wide receiver 12. And it's not because there's a massive difference between four and 12. It's just going to be that's the way that the NFL decided to rank them on the day. And they're, they're actually genuinely kind of first-round talented players that might end up sliding that far. I, we talked about him earlier, but Troy Franklin is one I could absolutely see um, that happening to. He's got you know speed, he's got size, he's got range, um, but he didn't have a great combine. And he sort of didn't look particularly comfortable during the drills, the gauntlet drill by him, um, where they run the line and, and are catching a sequence of passes left and right was was pretty ugly. There are a lot of people that are kind of sour on his tape that, that think it's a little bit concerning. But I think that guy's a first round talent and the, the grading and the production is off the charts. If he slides as far as um, Cleveland, I think that would absolutely be a steal. All right, I lied. There's one more question. Do you think because the draft, <laughs> the draft cycle is so long that you, do you do you default back to, well, let's watch the tape because by the time you go to the combine and you do that, you, you, you hear all kinds of silly stuff. I think back to C.J. Stroud, you know. Oh, he can't process information. I don't know. On the football field, he looked like he was processing it pretty well uh, this season. Yeah, I, I bet the tape is always the bedrock of everything, right? Every other step along the way, all these different things, whether it's the 40 time, whether it's a, a, a drill at the combine, whether it's data that comes out of it, whether it's you know things that you hear, all of these things that I think are just pieces of the puzzle, pieces of information, and they should always send you back to the tape to see if you can then see that. You know, if a guy runs a slower 40 that you thought he was going to run, let's go back to the tape and see if we can see instances where that lack of speed or the lack of time speed shows up. Or, you know, with, with um, the, the drills, you know, the, the, the gauntlet drill looking a little weird, let's go back to the tape and see if this shows up somewhere where he's not able to kind of um, stick on the line where he drifts too much or, or those kinds of things. So... None of it should, I think, supersede the tape. It should always just be used as a check to then send you back and see if you miss something first time around or if you if that added context sort of shows you something that you weren't processing the first time you watched the guy. Sam Monson, Pro Football Focus. Thanks so much for the time and the insight. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Sam. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Sam Monson, make sure you check him out. Really good stuff, free agency as well as the draft. Uh, check him out on Pro Football Focus. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, straight ahead. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Try c has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. All right, everybody. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. Like the $1 Lady Luck 5X. Because the pink really pops like my safety vest. Plus a $1,000 grand prize really ham is at home for me. And this $2 10X really nailed it for me. Two bucks for a shot at 10 grand? That's rock solid. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever with five price points from $1 to 20. They're built for fun. I am powerful beyond my wildest imagination. I will define my future. I will keep challenging myself to improve. Because I am a future leader of this great nation. I will be responsible for raising a beautiful family. And educating not only my generation, but many more to come. I will make a difference in my community. And I will stand up for what I believe in. I will not settle for simply chasing my dreams. I will achieve them. Because I was given a chance. An opportunity. A home at Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. The ultimate leadership experience. FCCLA has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's made me who I am today. Join us, we'll build a new future together.
We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. So take a look. This is really interesting. Teams with more 11 plus win seasons than the Browns during Andrew Berry and Kevin Stefanski's era. The Chiefs, the Bills, and the Cowboys. That's the list. <laughs> Let's welcome in Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer Cleveland.com. Tim, um, that was surprising. Yeah, I saw that and, and read it over a couple times, and it's legit. Pretty elite company, especially when you consider what the Browns did last season, you know, winning 11 games despite the fact that they were on five quarterbacks last season, that their starting quarterback in Sean Watson played just six games due to injury. And then you look at who else is on that list. you got the Chiefs, who are the, the modern dynasty of pro football. you got the Buffalo Bills, who have been as, you know, consistent as anybody. And you would figure if the Chiefs weren't in the AFC, the Bills would already be in a Super Bowl right now, or probably win a Super Bowl. And then the Dallas Cowboys, you know, they've been very consistent for all their faults in the playoffs. And, you know, those losses they've had in the postseason the last couple of years, they're still consistent or they're still getting there. So, you know, it's pretty good company to be in if you're the Browns. The thing is just, you know, they've got to keep it going. All right. I know you wrote an article um, how the Jerry Judy trade could impact what the Browns do in the upcoming NFL draft. Uh, take us through that, what you found and, and kind of your thinking behind it. Well, Obviously, with the Jerry Judy trade, the Browns traded a fifth and a sixth to get Judy from the Broncos. And the number one thing it told me is I personally would be, be pretty surprised if they stayed at 54. I mean, you look at this draft. I know I've talked before. You know, this is not a draft that has a lot of depth, you know, in the final couple rounds or whatever. But they have just five picks now, two in the top 150. And that's not enough. And that was before for me. That was before the Jerry Judy trade. And now they only have two picks in the top 150, both of which are day two picks. You're looking at, you know, in the fifth round, you're getting into the 150s before you're on the clock again. That's about a 70 pick gap potential. That's a 71 pick gap between 85 and 156. That's way too long. So I, I feel like knowing Andrew Berry's history, knowing that, you know, he's been able to find very good players in the third and fourth rounds, particularly Martin Emerson, Dewan Jones, and maybe you could even throw Alex Wright in there with the way he really stepped up at the end of last season. It makes a lot of sense for him to trade down, get another pick or two, you know, see if you can get an extra day two pick in there, maybe an early fourth or something like that, and just be willing to, to you know, consolidate a little bit. So um, this came out of the owners meeting, and it's from um, Mary Kay Cabot from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, your, your colleague, uh, Browns beat reporter. Um, Andrew Barry uh, on Cooper. Look, Coop's a Pro Bowl caliber receiver, played really well for us the last uh, two years. Strong pr presence in the locker room. We love them. So players like that, you want to make sure you can retain them as long as possible and we'll work through that at the appropriate time. Um, again, he had his, heads into the final year of the contract. They probably don't want to wait until after the season because you got, as we said in the, it, early in the show, you got Jamar Chase, you got Justin Jefferson. There are a number of higher end um, younger wide receivers who are going to reset the wide receiver market. So I expect them to do something before the season with Cooper. Yeah, that, that would be a smart bit of business. Obviously, you would assume he's going to get more money than Jerry Judy got, considering Cooper's got a much more proven, you know, NFL track record than Jerry Judy. What, but what's going to be most interesting with Cooper is, you know, you're, he's he's around that age, you know, people talk about the 30 and after, you know, their most receivers aren't the same, you know, are you going to really pay that kind of money to a guy when, you, you know, guys start to fall off typically after 30 with Amari Cooper. I feel like he's not going to be one of those guys who, you know, completely falls off the face of the earth after 30 because his game is not predicated on athletic ability. Now, granted, he's, he's a high level athlete for the NFL. You know, he's still got very good speed. But where he wins is with his intelligence, you know, with how he runs his routes with his hands. Those are things we've seen the last two years that he can win with speed. He certainly has that speed. He's got he's got good enough leaping ability, but he just understands how to get open. And I think those are things that, you know, as as you get older, you understand, you know, maybe you don't have as much speed anymore. Maybe you have to lean on that a little more. You have to lean on understanding how to get open. And those are things that don't necessarily that don't necessarily go away. And those are th reasons why I think, you know, Amari Cooper will age pretty well in the NFL. All right. So uh, this one from the dogs, a Cleveland Browns podcast. Um, this is why the Browns made the move for Deshaun Watson. 
From 2019 to 2022, there were a total of 43 quarterbacks drafted by NFL franchises, a lot of them in the first round. On opening day 2024, only eight of those 43 are locked in as their team starter. When you do the math, that is a hit rate, so a positive outcome rate of 18.6%. So when you have a younger quarterback who has been a successful starter, you go out and you get him, and that's what the Browns did. Now they haven't seen the results that they want yet, but those numbers explain why they were willing to do what they did. Yeah, I mean, that just goes to show just how hard it is to find a quarterback. You can do everything you want to do. You can do everything you can to scout a player. You can look at, you know, his physical makeup, his mental makeup, his numbers, you know, analytical measurements, everything you want to do. But ultimately, you cannot predict how they're going to play on the field. You know, you can't predict all those sorts of things. So, I mean, again, that's that's a very low number, 18.6% when it comes to quarterbacks. So, I mean, you look at even – even for the Chicago Bears at number one, as great as I think Caleb Williams is, there's no guarantee he's going to be great. There's never a guarantee on any of these guys. And you also see teams like, you know, the Minnesota Vikings, you know, maybe they have to trade up and get a quarterback and they may be getting the fourth best guy in this class potentially. So that's a, you know, obviously that's the type of thing you have to do. You have to be willing to take a swing at the quarterback position or, you know, you teams are going to replace you with somebody who will because of how important it is to find the guy. So in hindsight, obviously made sense for the Browns to go after the proven commodity. Unfortunately for them, it hasn't worked just because the Sean Watson hadn't been able to stay on the field for the last two seasons. And in order for that trade and that contract to work out, like I've said before, he's got to stay healthy and he's got to learn to protect himself much better. Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com and I can step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break. Uh, what free agents could reset the market in 2025? One of them is a Brown. Sports from CLA. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Try C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Tim Bielek from The Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Uh, this from the Bleacher Report. Predicting which 2025 free agents could reset the market next offseason. They say running back Nick Chubb, if he's able to quickly shake off the rust and prove that a pair of knee surgeries hasn't negatively impacted him too much, he could be in line for a, a handsome contract next spring. The Browns could give Chubb an extension in part to lower his cap it in 2024. If they instead allow him to become a free agent next spring, he could easily eclipse the money uh, that fellow veterans such as uh, Barkley, 12.6 million and Jacobs 12 million uh, per year uh, made this offseason. Um, you know what? If if Nick Chubb is back to being Nick Chubb, Browns will happily pay that. No question about it. I mean, why why wouldn't you? I mean, you could argue he's the most talented running back in football. I mean, the only guy you know you could really put it, the number one guy you could put in that discussion for a debate is Christian McCaffrey, and we've seen just how great he is for the 49ers. I think what's going to be for Chubb is you know, when does he come back from the knee surgeries? What, you know, and when he does, does he look like himself? Can he get to, you know, 80, 85% of what he was by the end of the season, maybe in the playoffs and those sorts of things. I think those are all legitimate questions with Nick Chubb, is, especially age. You know, I talked about that, you know, that dreaded 30 years old. He's getting right up there. So, I mean, yeah, you, obviously Nick Chubb's a different different guy. The Browns certainly have recognized it based on the things, you know, Andrew Burry and Kevin Stefanski have said about it, uh, about Nick Chubb over the years, especially, you know, came out of that regular season finale with the Batman mask on, smashing the guitar. It's clear he means a lot to this organization and the city. It's going to be interesting to see how that kind of plays out, you know, next season. You know, if, I mean, 
football can be cold as far as financial decisions go and those sorts of things. And the Browns do have to mind cap space in the future, especially, you know, if you keep pushing the Sean Watson money up further and further, I know the cap's going to go up, but you still have to kind of be a little mindful about it. So it's going to be interesting. It For me, it just comes down to can Nick Chubb be what, close to what he was before the injury. If so, then I think it's pretty well worth it. Yeah, and, and the other thing is I would expect them to redo his deal this year. I would expect them to have a lot of incentives where if he gets back and is healthy, he makes every bit of the money that he was due. Um, this is also interesting. So this is NFL GM's average age of players drafted going back to 2011. Under Andrew Barry, round one, average age, 20.94 years, only been two players. Rounds uh, one and two, 21.24. Uh, there have been four players. Rounds one through three, 21.63, 12 players. So those age guardrails that we talk about all the time, they exist. What will be interesting, Tim, I think, is uh, particularly this year, because you don't have as, and with, in the NIL era, you don't have as many underclassmen who are declaring because they can make some money with uh, NIL in college. And the other thing is, like this year, you've got all of the fifth year and, and sixth year, in some instances, seniors because of COVID. So the, the age of the players is kind of going up. Yeah, I think this might be what I'm kind of thinking as the one year speed bump in, in terms of both those things. And why I say that is because, you know, th this upcoming year, we're getting towards the end of when guys can exercise that sixth year. I believe, you know, that was for guys that were on the teams in 2020. So 2024 would be doing the quick math in my mind. That'd be five years. 2025 season would be six. So we're almost at the end of kind of the super senior era of college football. I think they're like, like I said, there's one more year left of this. And then when it comes to NIL, all you, what you're essentially doing is you're taking all those guys who would have come out this year and you push them out a year to where maybe they get a little more development in college, you know, with that, with that extra year of NIL. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, those, those young men, you know, college football is a really difficult sport. And if those guys can get a little extra money and not have to, you know, go into pro football too early. They can, you know, do all those sorts of different things they need to do in college. You know, I think it, it serves them better, but for the Browns, I think it creates an interesting challenge, especially, you know, when you get into, you know, that sixth and seventh round, if considering this class may not be as great as you would think, you're not going to, you might not be able to trade those sixth and seventh round picks. You might have to take an old guy, older player. You might have to take that 25 year old prospect that you don't think about that. You typically don't want to take. You might not have a choice because again, 2022, Isaiah Thomas, 23 years old, the only time I believe the Browns took a player. That was the first time, actually, they took a player who at the time of the draft was 20, 23 or older than last year. Andrew Barry, I think, surprised us all with Cedric Tillman in the third round because, you know, you and I had been talking about a bunch of younger players, and then all of a sudden they take Cedric Tillman. He's 23, and that seems like the outlier. So I think for the Browns more so than anybody, it's continued proof that, you know, when you look at who they're going to draft, Look at the younger players. It's going to be harder to find them this year. Next year, I'm sure, could be could potentially be a different story. All right. Uh, before we go to break, um, this again, Andrew Barry, uh, how he uses his top 100 picks. If you see uh, nothing on here, that means they haven't drafted any from that position. So wide receivers, 25%. Defensive tackles. 16.67, linebackers 16.67, cornerback 16.67, safeties 8.33, edge rushers 8.33. Um, I think it's important to note, you know, there aren't any offensive linemen on here because they had established offensive linemen. So that's it's kind of relative to what the roster makeup was. Um, it surprised me that there were that many uh, wide receivers taken. Yeah, I think it just goes to show, you know, Andrew Berry's continue to try and plug away at that position. You know, Anthony Schwartz in 2021 didn't work out. David Bell, you know, I think there's still potential there for him to be, you know, a solid pro receiver, maybe kind of a fourth guy, you know, maybe a solid possession guy. We saw flashes of it during the season. Cedric Tillman, I think, you know, there's raw, there's some rawness to his game. He kind of needs to smooth out this offseason, and I think that, you know, 
maybe this season, you know, with a full offseason under his belt, especially, you know, working with Amari Cooper, you know, as you would imagine, they do in practices and all those sorts of things. Maybe, you know, he really takes a step forward. But it goes to show that receiver is a premium position now in the NFL, and you keep swinging until you get the guy, you know. And I've said before, this is an outstanding receiver class. To me, it's the deepest position class in this entire draft. I know it may sound like, you know, counterintuitive well they just traded for jerry judy why are they going to go draft another receiver well you look at you know we talked about the potential of extending amari cooper elijah moore is an unrestricted free agent you want to keep throwing bodies at that position because you never know when you're going to hit because again the draft is not about tomorrow it's not even about this coming season it's about you know two three years down the road and the best player on your board is a receiver go ahead and take him especially if you think he's got the potential to be a high level starter for you for within a couple seasons Tim Bielek from The Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com and I are going to step aside, take one more time out, other side of the break. Tim has done a mock draft with some trades. We'll dive into that. Sports for CLE will be right back. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K through 12. Is your K through 12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the school of the year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns with Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. So, Tim, I know you've done a mock draft. We're going to start uh, out with a couple of trades. Uh, what's a mock draft without some trades? So, you have the <laughs> Browns trading uh, picks 54 and 206 to the Washington, Washington Commanders for picks 67 and 100. And then you have the Browns also trading Greg Newsom to the Cardinals for pick 90. So, the Browns uh, end up with 67, 85, 90, and 100. All right. Let's go through them. Picks uh, 67, you have the Browns taking Malachi Corley, wide receiver, Western Kentucky. What do you like about Corley? I think he's a different body type, you know, than what the Browns have, a different play style than what the Browns have. They don't really have that guy who can get those yards after the catch. And I think Corley, you know, is a guy who's stuck, stuck out to me. As I wrote, you know, just for some reason, ever since the Jerry Judy trade, Corley is a guy I can't get out of my mind as a guy that would fit the Browns because he, he has such a different style than everybody they have. You know, there's a lot of comparisons to Debo Samuel. I think that that's more in play style, I think, than ceiling. If, if he somehow is in the Debo stratosphere, this is a this is a home run pick. But when I say the Debo style, I mean he's a guy you just get the ball in his hands any way you can, and he has enough open field ability. He's bigger than most corners, about 200, 210, 215. He can you know make people miss, and any guy who can take a two yard completion and turn it into eight to ten yards, you know that's so massive in the NFL. Anytime you get extra yards. In the passing game, you know, if you can make that first guy miss and make the other uh, defenders have to come over and tackle you, that just really makes offense easier if you have guys that can generate those plays. So that's why I keep looking at, you know, Corley is an interesting piece. Maybe he needs a little time to learn nuance, kind of like Cedric Tillman did. But unlike Tillman, I think Corley is a guy you can put out there and, you know, for lack of a better term, gimmick situations. The At 85, then, you have the Browns taking defensive tackle from LSU, Mason Smith. What do you like about Smith? Well, I got to give my colleague Ashley Bastock some credit on this one. Ever, she wrote about him way back at the Combine. And, you know, the more I thought about it, especially with, you know, the Browns bringing back, you know, the veteran defensive tackles that they did, you know, Maurice Hurst, Shelby Harris, you know, because they still have Dalvin Tomlinson, Siaki Ika, you know, you can afford to take a defensive tackle who, in my mind, you know, like most defensive tackles probably needs a year to redshirt. I'm of the opinion that any defensive tackle you draft basically needs a year before you can really put them out there in certain situations. And I think Smith's a very, you know, Smith's a, a player who I think that could be worth an investment. Six five three zero six was a former five-star prospect. 
LSU's lined him up on the edge and in the interior because of that's the kind of athlete he's been. Tore his ACL in 2022, but came back in 2023, had solid numbers. This is kind of a projection type of player. But again, you know, when you have so much veteran depth in front of him, considering, you know, the defensive tackle position, like I said, has a higher learning curve than most other positions. This is not a bad p- position or player to take, you know, a little bit of a project on, you know, it's, it's like with receivers, you know, you keep swinging until you find the guy and hopefully in two years, if you're, if you draft them, they could turn in something. I mean, look what, look what happened to Jordan Elliott, you know, in his final year, it took a couple of years, but the Browns got, you know, solid defensive tackle play out of him in his, in his final year for his rookie year. All right. The uh, other two at 90, Audric Estime running back from Notre Dame. And then at pick 100, uh, Roger Rosengarten, offensive tackle from Washington. Take us through uh, those two, what you like about them. It's been pretty clear. Estime is my, one of my guys, you know, one of my absolute f- favorite players in this entire draft class. I've talked about him a bunch before. You know, he ran a 4 7 one at the combine. That didn't bother me, you know, because speed's not his game. And I know he improved it at his pro day the other day, just ran a 4 5 8, so that's much better. I think with Estime, you know, there's a when I think of Estime, I think a lot of David Montgomery, you know, a guy who's not necessarily going to have a lot of breakaway runs, but he's going to get chunk yards. You know, he's going to be tough for the first guy to bring down. He's more elusive than you would think for a guy of his size, you know, at five, at a uh, five eleven, two hundred twenty one pounds, you know, I mentioned, I think it was like 20, 22 runs or so that of 15 plus yards. And that's a tremendous number in college. You know, when you look at a stat that translates from college to the pros, explosive run rate is there and estimate, as I've said before, he you knows, measures similarly in that category to how Nick Chubb did in Georgia. I don't know if he, he's probably not going to be as good as Nick Chubb, but if you're looking for a power comp- component of a tandem backfield, SMA is that guy. And especially if you're looking for kind of a hammer back to put in goal line situations to replace Kareem Hunt, I think SMA is your guy. And then going to 100, Roger Rosengarten, it's, it goes back to my number one, one of my number one draft rules is no matter how good your offensive line is, I don't care if you have the greatest offensive line in the world, You draft one every single season because, you know, especially with the Browns, we saw they were on their fourth and fifth tackles last season. And James Hudson's in the last year of his rookie contract. So you want to develop another swing tackle or potential starting option. Rosengarten, you know, started the last two seasons at Washington. Very good pass protector and and playing the right, play the right tackle at Washington, which considering they had a lefty quarterback in Michael Penix Jr. He has experience being a blindside protector in case, you know, he moves over to the left side, but he's a guy that probably needs to get a little stronger. But again, considering who the Browns have in front of him at offensive tackle, where you're still trying to figure out who your two stars are going to be out of three guys, you can really let Rosengarten develop behind the scenes with new offensive line coach, Andy Dickerson grow. And maybe in 2025, you either, either, you know, if Jedrick Wills and Jack Conklin, for example, both leave or whatever, or, you know, you still have two of those three guys, Rosengarten can really slide in and be kind of a swing tackle, potentially an emergency starting option. Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, as always. Great stuff. Uh, appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Tim. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good day. All right, Tim Bielek, make sure you check him out. Really good stuff uh, relative to free agency as well as the NFL draft, Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. It's gonna, we're going to step aside, take uh, one more time out. Other side of the break, Sam Amico from HoopsWire.com. We start talking Cavs. Only 10 games left in the regular season. Sports for CLE. Be right back. Stay with us. Go ahead and pop a clamp on that. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery, like this new $20 100X with its million-dollar grand prize, I want to get my cut of that 76% payout. So, good news. We're playing the largest family of scratch-offs ever. These Lady Lucks have all the fun and no complications. We turn our attention to the Cavs here on Sports for CLE. Uh, Cavs snapped a three-game losing streak beating the Hornets Monday night. Good news is they play the Hornets again tonight. Cavs currently third place in the Eastern Conference, two games behind the Milwaukee Bucks, half a game in front of the Knicks, 10 left to go. Let's welcome in Sam Amico from HoopsWire.com. Sam, what does J.B. Bickerstaff need to see from his team to feel better these last 10 games going into the playoffs, do you think? 
Yeah, I think the first thing would be obviously the ball movement. When that happens, uh, they've been really successful offensively, um, and it just seems like they're even better defensively, as funny as that sounds. But it, it, it just energizes you uh, when the basketball is moving offensively. Everybody's getting their touches. Everybody's getting their shots. And mostly, you know, you're, you're producing. It, it, against Charlotte the other night, we saw the basketball move in the first quarter, and nobody could make a shot. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you keep doing it and it, and it works out pretty well for you. So um, I think that's the first thing. Defensively, they're usually pretty good. Uh, I, I wouldn't think J.B. Bickerstaff needs to worry about that. But as long as they keep doing that, uh, they should have some success. And, and Dave, you know, when they score, when, when they hold the other team under 100 points, they're 13 and 0 this season. So. Uh, you know that's a, that's a big goal of theirs every game because when they do that, they're they're usually getting a victory. Um, starting to get healthy. You tweeted this out a little bit earlier. Uh, Max Struess has missed um, quite a bit of time lately. Uh, upgraded to questionable for um, the Hornets. Mobley back. He was still Garland targeting, or uh, rather Mitchell targeting um, a game later in the week. So. Starting to get healthy, is, is 10 games enough to kind of get everything headed in the right direction for the playoffs, do you think? Yeah, you know, I think that it's usually five. Uh, so that's the goal is to have them all back uh, before then. And it sounds like, you know, if Mitchell isn't back by Friday's game against the Sixers early next week, um, he's obviously making great progress. Max Struess. If not back tonight against Charlotte, be back, uh, I'm assuming, Friday night. So, I mean, there's your two starters right there, including your leading scorer and, and all-star in Mitchell. And then I, I'm hearing that Dean Wade is pretty close, too. So if you can get them back within, yeah, 10 games would be nice. That's not going to happen because after tonight they'll be down to nine <laughs> games left. But, you know, so if you can get them seven, eight, six, somewhere in that range, uh, you'd be feeling good about, you know, having getting getting them some reps ahead of the playoffs. So uh, this one from the Bleacher Report: Teams trending in the wrong direction at the wrong time, and and they say the Cavaliers, uh, from early January to mid February, no one was hotter than Bickerstaff's bunch. Uh, first 19 outings of the new year, 17 wins for the Cavs, a plus 15.9 net rating over that stretch. They've cooled considerably. Due in part to mounting injuries, but also rapidly declining efficiency um, at both ends. And, and Sam, I think those two things are interrelated. If you're talking, you don't have four guys that are rotational. I would imagine it's pretty reasonable to assume your efficiency is going to suffer pretty significantly. I mean, I'm not a basketball guru like you are, but that just seems to make sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it, missing your all-star and leading scorer hurts enough on its own. But then you throw in, you know, your starting wing and Max Struess, uh, Dean Wade, who's been filling in for Mobley very well this year, um, especially defensively, you know, when either Mobley's out or when Wade comes in. And he, he really plays backup when, when he's not starting, when Dean Wade's not starting. He's playing backup a lot of times, not just Mobley, but Struess and Jared Allen. So, I mean, he's playing really all three front court positions. Doesn't score a lot, but he does a lot for you defensively when it comes to defending on the perimeter, uh, Dean Wade. So, I mean, all of those, obviously Mitchell and Struess are starters, but, you know, missing Wade, it really kind of throws everything off. I, I remember a couple weeks ago when Mobley was hurt, I was like, you know, George Nyang is starting, not for Evan Mobley, but for the guy who replaces Evan Mobley. So that makes sense that their efficiency isn't quite as good as it had been um, and, and the wins aren't as, as frequent. What you want to avoid are those really bad losses like Sunday at Miami uh, where you just didn't show up. Uh, you, you need to avoid that when you're getting so close to the playoffs. You can't, you can't be leaking oil. Uh, as they say at this time of year, you've got to pull it together. And I think before anybody panics, you know, you got to see what they look like with Mitchell and Struess and and lesser to to a lesser degree Dean Wade. But 
I, I think you got to see what they what they look like before you get too worked up about it or talk about their efficiency. You, you know, you, you mentioned, and, and it'll be interesting to see if they sign Marcus Morris to another contract. But if you add Morris, Struess, Yang, and Tristan Thompson, those are guys that you know they're. On the court, in the playoffs, in any type, they're not going to be pushed around. In fact, they're going to do some pushing around. And, and um, you know, missing Struess, I, I think Struess just brings a, a kind of toughness. And I think, they've missed, I think they've missed that. Yeah, he definitely brings an edge. And I think that, you know, you, you take a look at Marcus Morris now, who they signed to a 10-day deal. His contract is up, this 10-day contract's up Thursday. I'd be really surprised if they don't either sign him to another one or sign him for the remainder of the season uh, for the very reasons you talked about, Dave, which is he brings an edge, he brings, you know, physical play and, and kind of an attitude. Um, you know, we saw him the other night, and I, and I say that as a positive thing, attitude. Um, saw him the other night, got thrown out of the game, and it was right after that that the Cavs took off. Uh, against the Hornets, kind of been lollygagging and messing around, uh, just not showing any energy. And, and Marcus Morris gets thrown out, and all of a sudden the Cavs go on this huge run. J.B. Bickerstaff even said after the game, you know, he's a guy who understands the moment, understands what it takes sometimes to get light a little bit of a fire under you. And Morris, at 34 years old, uh, still really has a lot left uh, in terms of that type of play. He plays a playoff style of basketball all season long. So, yeah, not having Struess, uh, they lost a little bit of that edge. Uh, same thing, you know, now that they – even Mobley doesn't talk or it doesn't isn't viewed as real physical. Defensively, you know, having him out there really gives you a presence. So um, just getting their pieces back I think will, will give them – Kind of, a, and I would say Jared Allen's been playing mm -hmm. more physical this season than he was uh, in the, obviously in, in the playoffs last year. So uh, this, um, we kind of alluded to it. Donovan Mitchell targeting a return to action as soon as Friday's home game against the Sixers, according to sources. Mitchell um, has been sidelined since March 16th due to knee issues, and then came back and. And Tristan Thompson uh, fractured his nasal cavity, so he got a broken nose. Um, you know, it, I, and you can't – it's just facts. They're a different team uh, when he's on the court and when the ball is in his hands predominantly. They are just different. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's funny. I said that to one of the sports writers at the, at the game the other night that – uh, you know, I'm obviously covering them all year, and I, I, I said I felt like I was writing about a different team the other night than I was in January, like I was covering a whole new team because they're just obviously not nearly as efficient without Mitchell. They, they don't have that dynamic, and that's why they traded for him, so they would have that dynamic score uh, when things get tough, when things are dragging going slow, they can't find a basket, well, then you get it to Mitchell and let him go. And uh, they just don't have anybody who can do that at that level when he's off the floor. You know, I mean, they just they haven't gotten it from Darius Garland. I, I think he's having a down season. And, you know, in his defense, part of that is probably because he lost eight pounds when he couldn't eat with a broken jaw. And, and that takes some time to come back from. But he's just not been... Uh, the Garland that everybody hoped for. He's had his moments, had some good games, just not, uh, just, you know, they kind of were looking at when they traded Donovan Mit for Donovan Mitchell, it's kind of Mitchell being 1A and Garland 1B. It's it's really Mitchell 1A and Garland about B or C. So, um, and that's okay right now, but come playoff time, they're going to need that second guy. And uh, more than anything, they're going to need Donovan Mitchell. All right. Um, you tweeted this out as well, and, and you're starting to hear this from people who know Donovan Mitchell. Growing sentiment that Donovan Mitchell will remain um, with the Cavs. You're starting to hear players saying, players that know him saying he's, he's pretty happy in Cleveland. He seems to be really happy in Cleveland. Um, do, do you, is that, you talk to people around the league, is that kind of the growing sense is that um, there's a pretty good chance they're going to extend him and, and keep him um, as a Cavalier? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, they're going to offer him the max extension, whatever the Cavs will, whatever they can uh, give him, which is going to be more than anybody else can give him. And I do really think Donovan Mitchell is happy in Cleveland. I think he was happy in Utah, and he even said he would he would have stayed there uh, and gone through the rebuild with him. I don't think he's a guy who's looking to make his next move. At least that's the impression I'm getting from people around the league that, you know, Donovan Mitchell is not one of these guys who wants to go team up with a bunch of all-stars as, as much as the fans would like to see that that aren't in Cleveland. The fans uh, out of, outside of Cleveland seemingly want to see that in New York or Miami or wherever. Um, but in Cleveland, it seems like, you know, he's in a good situation for himself. He can make more money than anywhere else. And, and according to everybody I've talked to around the league, there's a third thing that's really at play here. And that's the fact that, you know, the team that is supposedly he's been linked to the most or the Knicks, they just are pretty well stacked right now and have no desire to shake up anything. And they would have to shake up their salary structure to land Donovan Mitchell unless he wanted to go play there on a minimum deal, which he doesn't want to do. So uh, there's, you know, the other thing at play is these other teams don't seem willing to sacrifice what they would have to 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 land Mitchell uh, even in free agency because, you know, at the end of next season, he could be eligible for free agency. If he doesn't sign an extension, there may not be anywhere for him to go you know, depending on other team salary structures. Uh, so it seems like the most favorable move for Donovan Mitchell right now would be to sign an extension in Cleveland. Sam Amico, HoopsWire.com, as always, great stuff. Sam, appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much. All right, thanks for having me, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Sounds good. Sam Miko, make sure you check him out. Always great stuff, uh, especially on the Cavs and the entire NBA as well. That's hoopswire.com. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.